Hey, good evening. This is Pastor Connor. It's May 14th, 7 o'clock. We're ready to go on with our Bible study. Hey, if you're able to join me live, fantastic. I'm so glad you're here. If you're not able to join me until later, I'm glad it works for you to join me whenever you join me. I want to say right now, before I forget, because I'm sure if I wait to the end, I will forget. Next Thursday night, we're not having Bible study. That's because we're having our Ascension worship service. That's the 21st. And you will be welcome to join us in person. And we will also be streaming that. But I will plan to do the Ruth Bible study on Tuesday. And God willing uh, that I remember, I'll put a reminder out for that, hopefully uh, by the first part of next week, like Monday or Tuesday, get the reminder out for that. But just put on your calendar, I plan to be live on 7 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday to do the, the Ruth Bible study. Unless we finish it tonight, and then we'll just wait a week and start the next thing. We'll see how far we get. It just depends how long the preacher talks. So, um, again, uh, you're invited to be a part of the 7 o'clock worship next Thursday evening, either in person or uh, uh, online. And either way you want to join us would be wonderful. We're just glad you're here. Okay, so we're in Ruth, and you remember Ruth happens during the time of the Judges, and this is one of those books in the Bible that you should probably not let your kids read on their own, right? I mean, there's some pretty gruesome stuff in here in the book of Judges, and you have this line that shows up over and over again. At this time, there was no king, and everybody did as he saw fit, or as basically as appealed to him, and we imagine what that would be like. It's utter disaster. So you have Elimelech and his wife, uh, Naomi. They take their two sons and move over to Moab because they've, they've got a famine. And the two sons die, the husband dies, and uh, you have Ruth is left destitute, and uh, Naomi decides to go back with her. Now, a little more of the backstory, just to make sure I, I make this clear. I don't know if I did last week or not, but... Um, so when Elimelech left, what he most likely did, and we see this based upon what's coming up in chapter 3 and chapter 4, is he sold, well, not technically the land, because they weren't allowed to sell the land, okay? So the land was their inheritance to their families for perpetuity uh, until Christ. But they inherited the land, and so you couldn't sell the land. You basically would sell the rights to the crops on the land. I know it's kind of like a distinction without a difference, but that's what they would do. So Elimelech probably sold the rights to his field to somebody, and even though the land remained in his name. So when Ruth comes back with, or when Naomi comes back with Ruth, um, they're penniless because, yeah, she may have land in her name, but she has no rights to the crops off of it. So she has nothing. And so this is where Boaz, the Redeemer, is going to come into play. And we'll get to that part of the story as we go along tonight. So chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. So verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? So I remember last week how um, Ruth happened upon the field of Boaz, right? And we can see the... Uh, the author's sense of humor or irony or um, subtle way of indicating that God is at work here. Nonetheless, she ends up in Boaz's field, and Boaz is a kinsman redeemer for Naomi. He's of, he's of that family line, and you see God's providence at work to uh, um, not only provide for Naomi and Ruth, but ultimately to deliver Christ, and we're getting to that. But so this is this is just after they've kind of had this big discovery of who Boaz is and how fortunate uh, uh, Ruth was to have found herself in this field. Okay, uh, verse 2, Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So, okay, yeah, I'm trying to give this a rough analogy to today. You know, we our combines do all the threshing automatically where they separate the grain from the chaff and the chaff gets shot out the back, right? Well, you don't have combines then. And so you have a threshing floor and that's when you use this special threshing fork and you throw the grain up in the air 
and the grain falls back to the ground and the chaff is blown away by the wind, right? So that's where he is. It's threshing season and he's threshing at the threshing floor. Verse 3, wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. In other words, um, make yourself smell nice and look nice because Naomi has some plans here. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. Yeah, strange thing, uncover his feet. You know, what all this meant, not totally for certain, but it certainly was a way to get... Um, Boaz's attention, and it does, and we'll just let the narrator explain that to us, but at the very least, this was some way to get Boaz's attention to say to him, I have something uh, important I want to speak to you about. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his servant was merry, or his heart was merry, sorry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Now, we're not to think that Boaz is drunk here, all right? And you read chapter two, you see that Boaz is described as a worthy man, and you see the way he acts honorably toward uh, Ruth. So Mary would simply be, he has enjoyed his meal. He has, it, it's a very celebrative time, right? The same thing in farming culture today, harvest generally is a very celebrative time. It's a joyful time for the harvester. So they're, they're merry, right? They're, they're, they're joyful uh, in this, this uh, atmosphere. And so that's the idea here. Okay, um, into verse number seven. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Uh, now, you notice how... Um, he, he threshes, and then he lies down next to the pile. And you think, oh, why didn't he just go home and go to bed? Well, remember, security is not like it is today then. You don't have a big shed to lock it in. You don't have police. You don't have security cameras. When you're doing your threshing, you're not leaving that pile of grain. Not not until you've got it sold. You don't leave it because that's your livelihood. And so Boaz is guarding it. So at midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. Yeah, talk about understatement. I'm sure he was startled because as far as he knew, she wasn't there when he lay, lay down. So um, what's the story, right? He's startled. So it's midnight, so it's dark, right? So you, ha you have to think in terms of we don't have the same sort of darkness that they would have had because we have so many lights. I mean, our alarm clocks, our, our microwave clocks, our just little lights that are on all the street lights. So midnight is dark, dark, right? So he obviously can't see who it is. He says, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Now, look at what she says. Okay, we talked about this last week about the spread your wings thing, uh, the, 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 the wings of God's mercy and uh, the healing in the wings of the Messiah and being under the wings of the Lord was a way of referring to being under the protective blessing of the Lord. So look what she says. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Okay, now uh, this is an incredibly, it's a theologically rich and beautiful, well, it's more than this, but it's her request that she he would marry her. I mean, it's pretty bold, right? But it's theologically rich because this spread your wings, it was just Boaz who last chapter talked about that the Lord would spread his wings over her and protect her, bring her under his protective blessing. And here's Ruth basically saying, um, yeah, Boaz, that's going to involve you. So it's a pretty, pretty powerful moment here. For you are a redeemer. 
you are one who can redeem or buy back or bring back the the rights to the the um, the crops from the fields. You you are one who can bring that back into Elimelech's name. You are a redeemer, and this also brings with it the requirement to raise up an heir. And the heir, the child born to this union, would be the inheritor of the land. Not Boaz, not the Redeemer, the child. So it's, it's a big undertaking. Okay, and he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. So apparently there seems to be some age differential here between um, Ruth and Boaz. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. It's so refreshing to read this text, especially, okay, remember in which time period this takes place? This is during the period of the judges. What do we know about the period of the judges? Everybody's doing whatever he feels like doing. But here you have these two honorable people. They're very godly. And they're doing these beautiful things about respecting the, the other, about uh, um, praying the Lord's blessing, about honoring the Lord, about honoring this tradition of redemption. It just, it's such a beautiful thing to see, especially when you remember the context in which it happens. They're surrounded by gross immorality all around them. And here they are being honorable, God-fearing people doing what is right in the midst of a culture that is in love with what is wrong. So it's very refreshing. Okay, verse 12. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I, so one closer in relation. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Verse 14. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you were, are wearing and hold it out. So she held it. And he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went to the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will set, settle the matter today. So this beautiful uh, um, encounter that Boaz promises to do what is right, to ensure that they have a redeemer. Now there is one closer, and Boaz does the honorable thing, and he's going to speak with this man first. And I can see we've only been at this for about 14 minutes, so we're going to go ahead and go into chapter 4 and finish this up. Some great stuff here to finish up the book of Ruth. Okay, now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, uh, by the way, uh, this is this is fun. Um, this this um, this behold thing. This is this is just an attention getter in uh, Hebrew. It's a way of saying, "Hey, look at this. Uh, pay attention here. This is this is significant." And behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, "Turn aside, friend." sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. In other words, it's a way of saying, I would like to visit with you. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So he, he obviously is calling witnesses together. He has some official business he wants to tend to, and he needs to have witnesses there. Very common practice here in this ancient world uh, where a lot of the city business was done often in the city gates. And so this is a very common thing to, to gather people together for the business he wants to address. Okay, verse 3. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, 
who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So, um, well, so basically, I, I think you can also translate it has sold, which I think makes more sense out of what's going on here. Okay, so, because uh, the Hebrew, okay, bear with me just for a second. The Hebrew is in the perfect tense. So, it's basically saying the land is in a state of having been sold. That's what the perfect tense means. I know that's complicated. We really don't speak that way very often in English, but it's in a state of having been sold. That's the idea. Okay. It's not that she's so much selling the land. It's in a state of having been sold. So like I mentioned that years earlier, Elimelech had probably sold the rights to the land. And so when Naomi returns to, uh, Israel, she's penniless. She has no rights to the crops on her ground. Okay. Okay, so uh, verse four. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. So, so far, this other redeemer only hears a prospective prophet. Um, it's sort of like when farmland goes up for sale today it's farmland isn't going up for sale you know every other day it's it's a big deal when farmland goes up for sale so he sees this as an opportunity to buy some farmland uh, and basically he's getting first dibs on it which is kind of a big deal so he says if you will redeem it redeem it but if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Now, this is great. I, I don't know if Boaz kind of sets him up here or what, but it's like the, oh, yeah, one more thing moment, right? Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. In other words, oh yeah, so you're going to buy the land, basically the rights to farm the land, and Ruth comes with the package, and the heir, the child that you would have with Ruth, he inherits the land. So it doesn't perpetuate your family name. It doesn't actually get added to your wealth. It will go to your offspring. And he will bear, yes, he's your child, but he will actually bear the family name of Elimelech, and he will perpetuate that family name. So, I mean, it's a big deal to be the redeemer because you're, you are doing something for the dead man. It's not for yourself. You don't stand to gain financially from this. So when this man hears this, verse 6, the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance, right? Uh, well, that's going to mess up my future. I, I can't do that. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So he backs out. Now, verse 7. This was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction... The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. I don't really understand why. I mean, I just suppose you could say a handshake is just as weird in our culture, even though now we're not doing that anymore. We're just waving at each other. But this was kind of like signing a contract. You gave the other your sandal, which, I mean, that is a big deal. I mean, for us, we think that's not a big deal, but you might only have one pair of sandals, right? So to give up one was a big deal, right? It was in, indeed forfeiting um, um, the land, and it was a sign of an agreement. Uh, uh, so it was a big deal to give up your sandal, I guess is the way to put it. Verse 8, so when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day, that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilian and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife. In other words, I have redeemed her as well. To perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, 
that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So again, you see the honorable thing that Boaz is doing. He's called witnesses together. He's, he's made sure everything's on the up and up. He's given the man who's actually closer in relation the first opportunity. He has declined. And Boaz makes it clear that I am doing this for Elimelech and for his two dead sons, that to perpetuate their name so that their name will not vanish from the earth. It's an honorable thing that Boaz is doing. Verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. So you hear that name Ephrathah. Uh, so that also shows up in Malachi with the prophecy of the Messiah coming from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, right? So here's some of the backstory to David, which is where this is going, and that Jesus is going to be from the house and the line of David from Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Well, it goes all the way back into Ruth. Right, this 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 language shows up, okay. Uh, in verse twelve, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So this is a prayer that God would bless uh, uh, Boaz and and uh, Ruth and make them fruitful, and that this offspring would be blessed. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. So again, one of the major themes of, of Ruth is the concept of redeemer. And we see the roots of the concept of Christ as our redeemer. The one who is, who is giving of himself to buy us back, to bring us back to ensure our inheritance. He's our redeemer. So we see this concept all the way back here in the book of Ruth. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. I mean, th this was a huge, huge boon for, for Naomi. I mean, just, just her heart is filled with joy after so much grief. There's so much joy. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So, okay, huge thing here. When we see the buildup here to... Um, the lineage of David. This is a big, big deal. So Obed means one who serves. It's just what his name means. But because he was the one who was going to care for the earthly needs of his mother and grandmother, he would serve them. So they named him Obed, the one who serves Naomi, especially uh, in her old age, but also his mother, Ruth, he would be the one who would care for them. Okay. So, but the, the, the lead up here, they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, right? Oh, so now you see how this has been leading up ultimately to be about Jesus all along. This has all been a big buildup to give you the backstory of David. And through David, we have the promise of the Messiah, right? Who is the Redeemer. The themes here that get woven together are just absolutely remarkable. Okay, just to wrap it up here. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now, this is not a complete list of generations. Um, you have basically, it's not meant to be the complete lineage. You have this happening in other places in scripture where you'll simply have basically summaries of the lineage. But the point here is that these are the, the, the ones who led up to King David, right? It's all about leading up to King David. 
who is getting ready to be introduced in the next couple books of Scripture. So you get to First and Second Samuel, and you come through the judges, the last of the judges with Samuel, and the transition person as the anointing the kings. We get to Saul first, and then to David. So it's this transition piece showing the backstory to David, ultimately then getting us ready for Christ, our Redeemer, who has healing in his wings. Right? The prophets will then prophesy about this Messiah who will come with healing in his wings. And so you see God working as a, uh, a master weaver. And these threads continue to, to work their way through the narrative. That's the great thing about Scripture is, is the more you read it, the more these threads start to become very visible to you. So it's the same thing with the tapestry. If you were to spend time studying a tapestry, at first it's just a just a picture, nothing major, not a big deal. If you start to, to get closer to it and study the artistry and the, the way it's been woven together so carefully and you follow how the different strands make their way through it and how it fits into the larger whole, and you realize this was a master artist who did this. This was not some slipshod deal, but a master artist has worked this tapestry into this beautiful image that it is. And so the more you read scripture, and you see these threads being woven throughout, the more that tapestry starts to come to life for you, the more color it has, the more meaning it has, the more you see the handiwork of its creator. So um, I thank you so much for taking the time to, um, to walk through the, the book of Ruth with me. Uh, it's such a fabulous book. I would commend it to you uh, to, to you know, read it again on your own time and to see the threads as they start to pop out now as we've read through it, through it together. Now, since we did finish this tonight, we will wait a couple of weeks to start our next Bible study, but we'll be back next Thursday nonetheless. And you can join us at seven o'clock live uh, for our Facebook Live for our worship service, our Ascension service. You can also join us in person if you're in the area. We would love to have you be a part of that. Um, I encourage you to hit the share button of other people journey through the, the book of Ruth. What a great book to study. And I thank you for your time. Let's take a moment to close with a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks to see your master work as you, as this, this tapestry weaver, this mastery, master weaver, weaving these threads throughout scripture, the, the thread of the redeemer, the thread of the healing in the wings of the Messiah, the thread of the Davidic line of the Messiah, all we see already in the book of Ruth. And Ruth, to understand what's going on in that culture all around it, just there's gross immorality all around, and yet you're working something beautiful through Boaz and through Ruth to bring us Christ, Christ who is the source of beauty in the midst of the, the ugliness of sin in our world. And so we see you weaving these threads, the master weaver, uh, working your salvation all throughout Scripture and even to our own lives as you weave us into your story of salvation. Thank you for bringing us into this story for joining us to this masterpiece and how we long for the day when it is brought to its full completion upon Christ's return and we can celebrate it and enjoy it forever. Thank you for those who have joined us. May you bless them by your spirit working through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me and I look forward to the next time we can gather. Have a wonderful evening.